Hey there, Sam. Here's what we're going to build in this lesson. I've got a prompt here that keeps telling me to click on OK, and it won't stop until I actually click on OK. And it keeps track on how many times I click on the Cancel button. Spoiler alert, this is done through the power of looping. Let's dive into the code straight away. Before we start learning about looping, let's talk about iterables. In short, iterables are data that we can loop through. In JavaScript, there are three data types that we consider as iterable. The first one is array, second, string, and third one, object. So we know from the previous video that array is a group of items stored in one place. Let's learn how to manipulate each individual element inside an array. Suppose we have an array called fruits. If we want to access a particular fruit in the fruits array, we can type in the array name fruits square bracket and the index of the fruit. What is an index anyway? Index is sort of like an ID of an element. Index is numeric and they start from zero. So in our case here, apple will have an index of 0, orange 1, kiwi 2, durian 3. So here we put in the index as 0, so we get apple out of the fruits array. And if we put in 2, we get kiwi. We can override the value of an element by simply assigning a value to it. So here if I want to override the value of orange, I'll simply type in fruits square bracket 1 because orange has an index of 1 and set it equal to lemon. Now if I console out fruits, you'll see that Index number one is now lemon instead of orange. We can extract a part of an array out by using the slice function. So here's how it works. So if we want to slice our fruits array, we type in fruits.slice starting from index number one and ends at index number three. One thing to keep in mind is that the ending index in the slice will not be included in the extraction. So that's why we only see lemon and kiwi. If we don't pass in the ending index, so the slice function will return everything from the starting index. So fruit slice index 2 will give us everything starting from kiwi. We can grab the length of an array by using the length property. The pop function will remove the last element inside an array, and the push function will add a new element to the end of the array. So we have deleted durian using the pop function and added great using the push function. So that's why we see great showing up as the last element. Shift allow us to remove the first element, and unshift allow us to add a new element to the beginning of the array. So now we get banana instead of apple as the first element. If we want to delete a particular index, we can use the splice function. Let's say we want to delete index number one. So we'll call the splice function, and the first argument or parameters that we're going to pass to the splice function will be the index of the element that we want to delete. The second argument will be the number of elements that we want to delete from the starting index. So that will delete lemon from the array. If we want to insert an element to an array, we can also use a splice function, but this time the delete count should be zero. And we should pass in a third argument as the item that we want to insert. Now let's talk about object. Again, objects are a list of key and value pairs. Let's say we have an object called car, and our car will have a name, brand, and color. The keys of an object are also called as a property of an object. We can access these properties by two ways. The first way is using the dot notation. So if I want to access the car name, I'll just type in car dot name. The second way is using a square bracket notation. To access the car name, we type in car square bracket and the property name in string. Similar to array, we can also overwrite values in an object. So I can override the car name by typing in car.name is equal to abc. We can also use a square bracket notation to override the values. It's also possible to add new properties to the object after it has been created. Let's say I want to add an origin property to the car, so we just do car.origin equals to Japan. We can delete properties using the delete keyword. Just type in delete car.origin to delete the origin property. And now origin has disappeared from car. We can grab all the keys from an object as an array by using the object.keys function. And similarly, all the values as an array using the object.values function. Now it's time for us to learn about looping. But what is loop anyway? Let's say I want to print out all the elements inside my fruits array. The easiest way would be console logging out the elements one by one, right? Well, this can become very, very tedious when your array is very large. Do you really want to do this when your array has 100 items? Well, I hope not. Is there a better way to do this? Yes, and it's called looping. There are a few types of loop in JavaScript. The first loop we're going to look at is called the for loop. To write the for loop, we'll start with the for keyword. 
there are three parts in the for loop. The first part is initialization. This is where we put in the code that we want to run before the loop begins. I'll define a variable called index, which keeps track of the loop. We'll put in a semicolon and move on to the second component of the loop. The second component is a condition of the loop. So if this condition passed, then we'll run the loop. If not, we'll stop the loop. And here, my condition will be the index that I defined earlier is less than the fruit's length. So that means as long as index is less than the fruit's length, we'll keep running the loop. Put in a semicolon and move on to component number three. This is where we tell JavaScript on what to do after every iteration. We will increment the index by one using the plus plus operator. So that means after every iteration, we're going to add one to index. And finally, curly braces. And here is where we put in the code that we want to run for every single iteration. Let's make it concrete. Again, the first step in the for loop is that we initialize the loop in the first component. Then we check if the condition passes or not. If it passes, then we'll run the code inside the curly braces. And when the iteration ends, we'll run the third part, which will increment index by one. And we'll repeat step two until index is larger or equal to the fruit's length. So now let's try to print out every single fruit in the loop. First, we need to grab the fruit from the fruits array. We can make use of the index variable to grab the element in the current iteration. So we'll define fruit is equal to fruits square bracket index. Then we'll console log out fruit. And as you can see, the console is already printing out all the fruit names. So initially, index is zero, and zero is less than the length of fruits. So we'll run the loop, and fruits zero is apple. And we'll console log out apple. Then we'll increment index by one. One is still less than the length of fruits. So we run the loop again. Fruits square bracket one is now orange. And this process continues until we hit the end of the array. It takes a while to wrap your head around with for loop. If this doesn't make sense, stop for a while and try to go through the steps slowly. Okay? All right, let's move on. Sometimes I want to skip a certain iteration. To do that, we can use the continue keyword. For example, if I don't want to print out apple, I can do an if statement that would check if fruit is equal to apple or not. If it is equal to apple, then we'll continue to the next iteration. So now apple will no longer be printed out in the console. If we want to stop the loop or exit the loop, we can use the break keyword. For example, if I want to stop the loop at kiwi, I can make an if statement again to check fruit is equal to kiwi and break. So now we can only see orange because the loop now stops at kiwi. We can also loop string in the same way as we loop through an array. Strings and array behaves very similarly. We can access individual characters inside a string using a square bracket and also access the length of a string using a length property. Given these two behavior, we can run the for loop. Let's loop through fun stuff. VS Code has this cool snippet where it can generate the for loop code for us. So we don't need to write from scratch. Just type in for and look out for the black box and hit tab. Hit tab again to move on to the next placeholder. We'll change array to our variable string. Hit tab again and rename element to character because we're printing out the character of fun stuff. Console log it and we see fun stuff as its own individual character. Now let's learn to loop through object. Looping through object is a little bit more tricky than looping through array because object does not have the length property. So what can we do about it? As a workaround, we can use the object keys function, which will return the object keys as an array. So instead of looping the object directly, we'll loop through the object keys. Let's loop through car. Again, we'll bring out for loop. This time, array would be the keys of car. You can get the key of each iteration by using object.keys, car, and square bracket index. And the value of the key will be car square bracket, the variable key. Let's print them out. And we see the key names and their corresponding values. If you prefer to get a value directly, you can also do object.values car square bracket index. If you think that for loop is too much for you, luckily there are two more types of for loop that aims to ease your life. The first one is called the for in loop, which greatly simplifies the looping of object. Let's take a look at it in practice. Again, we start with the for keyword and we'll declare the variable for the key. You can give it any name you want, by the way, in or object name car. Then curly braces and the value will be car square bracket key. That's it. Can you see how this make the looping much more simpler? It is nice and clean and I like it a lot. But the only issue is it's much slower than its longer counterpart. So performance is a trade-off for its simplicity. 
Next, we have the for off loop, which is a simplified version for the array loop. Let's look through fruits again. We'll type in the for keyword and declare a variable for each iteration. In this case, we'll call it fruit of the array name fruits. And that's it. So if we console out fruit, we'll get each fruit directly. We'll finish off this lesson with the example I promised in the beginning of this video. There's another type of loop called the while loop. Unlike the for loop, which is looping through unknown data, the while loop is looping through an unknown length of data. This will make more sense when we look at the example. We'll feed the while loop a condition, and the while loop will keep running as long as the condition is satisfied. Okay, let's see how we can create the demo. We'll first create a counter that will count how many times the cancel button is being clicked. Next, we'll initialize a variable called response to be false. And here is where we want to write our while loop. We start with the while keyword, followed by a round bracket, and we put in the condition to run the while loop. And our condition is as long as the response is false, we keep running the while loop forever. Inside the while loop, we'll run a confirm function that will prompt the user to click on the OK button, which also include the click count of the cancel button. And we'll reset the variable response to the result of the confirm function. On every iteration, we also want to increment the counter by one. Because for each iteration being run, that means the user has clicked on the cancel button. So this while loop will keep running as long as response in other words, the user click on the cancel button on the prompt. Let's run our program. And as soon as I click on cancel, the increment goes up and it'll keep running until I click on the OK button. Just a side note, if you want to increment a counter by more than one, you can do so by using the plus equal operator or simply reset ii into something else. For example, if I want to increment by two, I can do ii plus equal two or reset ii equals to ii plus two. As you can see, as soon as I click on cancel, the counter goes up by two. There is a lot to take in this lesson. Play around with the code and make yourself comfortable with it. Key takeaway for this lesson, iterables are data that is loopable. In other words, we can go through the elements one by one. In JavaScript, strings, array, and object are considered as iterables. We use a for loop for definite situation. For example, looping through a known data. We use while loop for indefinite situation. For example, when we are uncertain, on when the loop will end. It's perfect for condition that's dependent on external factor, like user interaction. The for in loop and for off loop simplifies the original for loop, but they're slower as a trade-off. Leave a comment if you have any questions, and I'll see you again next time. If you enjoyed the content of this video, don't forget to hit the like, subscribe, and the bell icon for more content to come. It will really help me out. Thanks for the support.